Daniel will present other slides. And uh, in order to stay in the 13 minutes, I will not present my slides, only Daniel will present two slides. <laughs> okay. Uh, so what's the problem, the problem here? Oh. Uh, in data sciences, uh, there are methods that uh, appear to be, in some sense, non appropriate, and I will try to explain what does it mean, but still they are successful. Clear one. As we do not argue that are always successful. We do not argue that it's enough to record enough data to solve any problem. We simply observe that sometimes, more often than not, or perhaps not, but sometimes in a significant uh, uh, number of cases, they are successful and apparently they should not be in, in, in respect to the method we are now use. So the question that we want to ask is how they can be successful when they are. And so second question, uh, what sort of intervention of mathematics appears here? How mathematics enter uh, uh, natural and the social sciences in cases uh, uh, like that? Uh, these are the epistemological question that is this consideration implied. Uh, and what is the role of mathematics? So these are the two, uh, the two uh, points here that we want to try to tackle. Uh, Any other? Yeah. So for me, I, I'm a mathematician. So my my interest really is in mostly in the last two bullets, uh, which is how can we make a prediction of what methods are going to work, and what can mathematics tell us about why they work and how can we build different methods that are even more effective. Uh, I have to say that it, we, the first time I gave a talk on this topic was actually here at Dunam. Carlos invited me, this was maybe 2008, 2007, 2009, one of those years. And so uh, very, very nice for me to be back here and talk about this and how this developed. So uh, I have a couple of examples that I'm gonna use from my own research to to show what we mean by, by this, uh, by the challenge that we described. The first is a paper we wrote on uh, product projection of drought and, and rainfall in California following the El Nino years. You know, the El Nino is this warming up of the, I'm not gonna waste your time except to say that uh, none of these four people in the, in the title here is a meteorologist. And yet we made prediction that ended up being incredibly accurate, much more accurate than actually that virtually every other model that been written about. And the second, which I spend a little bit more time, is a, is a work trying to give an automatic classification of arrhythmia. So, and it's a long list of, of authors, so I only put uh, the, the two main, main uh, you know, Jang and Rakowski. And uh, the interesting thing is that none of us is a medical doctor. And yet we have some really interesting results about arrhythmia. Same, simple problem, we know what everything is, right? Uh, the rate of our beat is not regular. There are lots of different kinds. It's, it's a major killer. And doctors usually identify arrhythmia through your uh, electrocardiogram. They put mm -hmm. you on that lie down and they put these leads and then that gives uh, a sense of what you're doing. But the idea is, can we uh, automate this process and reach a precision that is higher than the one that the medical doctors do? So this would be a typical e ECG with noise. So part of the problem in this picture is that there is a lot of confounding factors. Yes, I thought uh, there, there are lots of confounding factors because the patient is moving, the, the instrument they're using on him and on me are different, the, the actual location of the lead, you know, there is so much uh, uncertainty there. So you have to clean it up. And what you really are trying to detect is this wave, which is called the QRS complex, that describes what happened in our, in our heart, right? The, the activation of the atria, the top part of the, of the, of the heart, the activation of the ventricular and then the reset of the system. So here you see some samples of a normal heartbeat, fast heartbeat. They kind of all look alike. So the doctors have to identify when they take the ECG, what, what is determined? Do we know that this guy has a problem uh, or not? And the problem with arrhythmia is that there are more than 20 different categories of arrhythmia depending on where they're caused, some of which are benign, so there is nothing to do except to tell the patient, you're fine, don't worry, and others could be potentially lethal. So we did develop a process that is fairly uh, exhaustive, and we look at 40,000. Uh, the, the reason why I'm, I'm showing these slides is because out of this, I'm gonna derive what the 
the questions are from, from more philosophic epistemological point of view. So we look at 40,000 patients. These are data that we took from uh, a series of hospitals in China. We eliminated the noise through this denoising uh, processor. Then we extract feature. What is a feature? Well, for example, is the, if I go back for, to this slide, is the height of the R peak. Another feature would be the distance between the Q and the S. Another feature could be the ratio between the height and the, and the Qs. And then all kinds of statistical measures that you can derive from that. So you can see you can generate a huge number of features, some of which are very visible to the doctor, right? If, if the, the way they're spaced, uh, the R peaks is very un, uneven, it doesn't take a genius to see if there is a problem. Some of these are mysterious because they're really statistically based. We run 19 basic classification algorithms. And then what we did is we trained the system on 10% of the data that we had, and we used that to generate what we thought would be an appropriate solution. And uh, we, we, we checked literally thousands once you do all of these, these are thousands of different, uh, uh, of different um, uh, algorithms. So why do I want to give this example? Because this, I think, is a good example of what we call agnostic science. The data set is huge, 40,000 electrocardiograms. The number of features that we are trying to distinguish is huge. The methods we applied, all of the methods that appear here, I'm sorry, in these blue boxes, and that I kind of skipped on very quickly, they're all methods that have been used in a lot of other situations. There is neural network, there is the uh, steepest descent, uh, there is boosting. So these are not new methods. And they work in some settings better than in others. So they are applied not really because we understand that they have a medical reason to work, but because they work in similar settings. We use very little, if at all, scientific knowledge. The only scientific knowledge here well, it's first of all the fact that we assume that ECG, the electrocardiogram, is relevant to the possibility of having arrhythmia. So that's it. And then the, the, the data were labeled and checked by doctors to make sure that we had appropriate kind of data. But the entire blue box that you saw before is, is, is blind, as we say here. And so the decision also which method eventually we would be using, we are suggesting to be used, is based on the fact that it works better. It's not based on the fact that, you know, clearly, there is a reason why this is better. So that's what uh, we, we call agnostic science. That's why I took a few minutes to describe yeah. that. Okay, it, uh, yes. it works better uh, than the other thing. What does it mean? It means that uh, after it, it has been uh, uh, invalidant and uh, analytical prolongation, prolongation, I mean, yes. analytical prolongation has made on continuation. the set, continuation, continuation. Okay. on the, the training set, it is tested. On the test. So Daniele said he worked on 10%. Does not mean that it used only the 10% of the data. It means that it, he made the prevision of the 10% of the data and then he tested the prevision of the other 90% of the data and modified it. At this point, we can say on the data that we have, that we have the question and an answer, in the end of the story, the answer that is given by the algorithm coincide that the answer that they already know because we know that the patient in question is dead yeah. or is alive or anything. <laughs> and then the analytical uh, continuation is made on the future. Now, this is essentially the point. So why we say that this is enough? Because the basic idea is that there is forecasting without understanding. Uh, what does it mean that there is no understanding? This is a question on which we try to reflect along. And because the notion of scientific understanding is a very difficult notion. And so in the beginning, we try to give a definition of scientific understanding in order to say that here there is no understanding. But in the end of the story, we found that this was not only quite impossible to do in a consensual way, but also useless. Because in order to say that there is no understanding, you do not need the necessary sufficient condition for understanding. You should only need the necessary condition. So we identify the two necessary conditions that are the capacity of identifying dependent between the, the variable that are, we consider, and uh, we are able to make a change of scale. So this, the, the, the meeting of the two characteristics seem to ask enough for saying that there is no understanding, even if I will not be able to explain you what is scientific understanding uh, in general. Uh, uh, much better philosopher as Axel of science possibly that will be able to say what understanding is, but we do not pretend to do uh, it. 
And so this is our terminology, what we call blind methods that are simply specific instances or analytic trials. And then the last point important is forcing. What do we mean with forcing? Of course, we are not speaking of Cohen forcing, there is not a theory here. In the question, even the basic idea is not so much a different forcing, is forcing the literally speaking in the two cases. What we want to say is that we force a, 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 a mathematical method on a phenomenon. Instead of look at the phenomena and try for the best mathematical method to work on it, we make exactly the different operation. We have mathematical methods that, that work. Work means in this case, not they give good results because this we do not know again, but work means that they are mathematically easy to uh, uh, apply. So we have, for example, uh, we work on a functional space. It is a functional space that we know uh, in, include a function that can be uh, 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 tackled and manipulated in an appropriate way. And we force this method on the uh, phenomena by hoping that once uh, we have made prediction on the testing, uh, uh, the testing, sorry, the uh, training set, this prediction has confirmed essentially on the training set. It has not confirmed that does not work, so that is, uh, that is finished. One of the most important cases of forcing this optimization. Optimization. Uh, why do we take it as a sense of, uh, of uh, forcing? Because optimization, the name of optimization, re remember the idea that we look for an optimum, a, a minimum, generally a minimum and maximum, but in fact, in most cases, a minimum. But this case, in this case, in many cases, we look for minimum functions that we do not absolutely know that that function was minimum is optimal. So there is no optimization. There is simply the mathematical idea of looking for the minimum and possibly I will say something about what, which minima. Uh, and we try to use this process of what we try. They try. You try, not me. I am not. By the way, this was one of my slides that is already <laughs> appropriate. <laughs> Uh, you all know how difficult it is to work with math. <laughs> okay. And this is so a case of, of forcing. Other cases of forcing apply like that. Uh, uh, one very quickly point on minima. Of course, in this way, we can detect uh, uh, local minima. Are local minima global minima? Of course, this method will not be able to tell us if a, a global minima are global minima. And uh, so, when we decide that the minima, they decide that the minima that has been found is the good one. Why? Apparently because it gives answers that seem to be plausible. And this is another essential point. There is no a posteriori confirmation. It cannot be a posteriori confirmation because there is no understanding exactly. So the only sort of a priori, posteriori confirmation is the fact that it does not only work on the training set, but works also in the real life. But of course, then in the real life, so there is the Tesla that go against the camion because it takes the cargo for a publicitary. This is, of course, this is part. So we are in no, in no way here to say that all work well, that there are not adversarial attacks. Of course, this is not the point. How it can work when it works. Um, so I think that this is essentially said again on forcing. Okay, also that I think. Well, maybe on forcing one thing that uh, smoothness yesterday actually <laughs> Jean 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 spoke about it, how we assume sometimes the existence of continuous function that represent the data when it's obvious that they don't exist. <laughs> More than continuous. More than yeah, continuous. we assume just because then with those functions we can do good stuff. We can do integration, we can do derivation, we have all kinds of theorems. But there is no reason a priori why, especially in some cases, we know the data are discrete and, and they are discrete by nature. And yet, we uh, one that is the uh, 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 last important question to say in general uh, not algorithms for big data are blind. What we want to say is that the blindness is not given by the fact that we have no control on the algorithm. This is not the part. The make an example that is page rank. Page rank is the first algorithm we use for Google. Now Google has used a lot of other algorithms for measuring the weight and the importance of a, 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 a page. I could, the algorithm is very, very simple. If I get 10 minutes more, I can 
So the algorithm, you, all of you, even non mathematician will understand it very simple. But if, so to say, uh, uh, it sticks, you start with an arbitrary distribution of weight, and the algorithm uh, correct the distribution, continue to correct the distribution by considering because the weight of a page depends on the weight of another page from which depends the, uh, the weight of the page. So, and when you apply it to enormous quantity of pages such on the web, of course, you do not have no way to control it. So there is absolutely no way to see what the algorithm is doing. But the algorithm is provably convergent. So the algorithm has been constructed in such a way that you can prove that it converges to the uh, uh, principal vector in, in, uh, in the matrix. So yeah, there is no blindness. There is simply lack of control. Lack of control because of the quantity of uh, uh, data, but you have no question of uh, lack of understanding. Of course, you can say that what the algorithm takes to be importance of the page is not important on the page, but it's only a frequency. You can just, but it's another story. Simply, the algorithm look what you want, it looks. You know what it looks, and you know it is convergent to what it is to be uh, looked. So that is important, according to me, you have not to confound agnostic science with lack of uh, control of the algorithm. Well, you know, one of the, you know, Marco, as I said, stole a portion of this, uh, of this line, which is okay, uh, but optimization is an example of forcing. So we assume, uh, I think for, also for historical reasons, the minima are what describes nature. And so we are looking for minima all the time. Uh, and obviously, you know, the example I do on the uh, gradient descent is when you're coming down from a mountain, if you just choose to go the, the fastest way, you don't necessarily go back home. You can get stuck in a little valley for, for a long time. So um, the, the claim here is very similar to what Marco was saying, and and virtually every method that uh, that is used in uh, in data analysis is ultimately an optimization method, even the one that may not look like, which is the so-called boosting methods. Now, boosting is something we use extensively, for example, in the paper on arrhythmia. So, what is boosting? It's an interesting idea. You take a bunch of weak classifiers. So start to classify things a little bit better than, than random, okay? So uh, a little bit better than 50%. So you wanna see whether this patient is ill with a certain disease, whether it's arrhythmia or anything else. And this classifier get it right 51% of the time. That's not really very good. But there are methodologies by which you can combine them and create actually very strong classifiers. And that's one of the things that we actually do in the paper. We take different, this, um, gradient descent methods, and then we boost them with this process. Now it's pretty standard. I mean, people in data sciences know how to do this, but you can get something extremely strong. If you look at the real analysis of, of, uh, of boosting algorithms, ultimately is once again a minimization of a cost function. A cost function that is not really necessarily related anymore to the initial problem. That is what's fascinating. That I think is what started my interest in this, is that one of my graduate students is Napoletani, which is the first author, he possibly was, a person. Huh? Possibly a person. No, no, it's not a person. No, I had, possibly, but that, 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 I don't know whether it's an author or not. Ah, okay. <laughs> well, he was a, a, a student. We don't know if he's the author. Exactly. <laughs> so he was my doctoral student, and we wrote a couple of things of theoretical math, which is what mostly I used to do. And then he started doing this more computational. And I remember my irritation when he would come and we would discuss stuff, and I would say, yeah, okay, I get it, but there is no real theorem here. You know, I'm a mathematician. I like a theorem with a, with a thesis and a hypothesis and a proof. And so that was the frustration that got me to get an interest in, in this thing. Why is it so? And, and the boosting that drives me crazy even now. Uh, it works, but, uh, but we don't know. One of the reasons we, we think that it's possible the blind method works is because we believe that there may be, it is a conjecture, so it's something which we've been talking for a while, there may be a correspondence between the structure of the algorithms and the structure of the phenomena that they describe. And uh, we, I think the next slide is gonna talk about what we call the brand method and maybe talk a little bit about it. But the idea is that the reason why the algorithm work is because their nature and the nature of the object that you study is very similar. And this is why they are applicable. Similar. Huh? Structural. Structurally similar, absolutely. And that is why you can apply to fields in which traditional mathematics does work so well. We don't need them for physics, but we need them for meteorology. We need them for biology. We need them for economics. So that's one of the, 
the thing that we think is, is a fruitful direction for our future future work. Yeah, I think you should. No, yeah. Um, uh, one thing, what this is totally similar with what? On the one side of the picture of the phenomena that we want to, by the way, one thing that we should not say, but it's important. This method is not intended to describe or explain phenomena. Are intended to solve the problem concerning the phenomena. Okay, so one, what seems to what is a similar to the phenomena from which the problem arises. But on the other side, what there is an algorithm similar? That's not the good answer. The good answer is a succession of algorithms. So the algorithm, what we try to, the, the point that we want to make with this conjecture, if you want to answer the question, why does it work? You have not to look at singular uh, uh, algorithms, but the way in which they change during the process, they modify. And so we use this principle that we call Brandt principle, the two Archie Brandt, I think that, that never uh, wrote the Archie principle, but he can talk at the sentence, from one of his papers, uh, Archie Brown is one of the most important uh, uh, An algorithm that approaches the state in its output and found the solution to the problem only to be replaced. It's apparently very, very trivial. But in fact, it's much less trivial because what does it mean uh, found a solution? Uh, 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 so, uh, uh, same state, it means that there is a minimum or a maximum, uh, generally a maximum. So the point is you arrive at a minimum and then you decide whether this minimum is the local one a lot fewer local one and the global one. If you decide that it's a global one, uh, you are finished. This is uh, your revision. If you decide that it is not a, a, a global one, what do you do? You have to change the algorithm. And this is what, what you change the algorithm that may, in fact, completely change the algorithm or change some parameters in the algorithm. In the most case, in fact, what you change is parameters. So, of course, to make precise here, you should have a condition of identity for algorithm, which is also a very difficult question to say. But there is a change in algorithm, at least in the case that you change some parameters. Sometimes you want to change the functions in the, in, or, or the functional space in which you look for the function to be op optimized. And so, what is happening here is, in fact, not a work of an algorithm, but a work of a section of algorithm. And it seems to us, that this, uh, 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 this structure, uh, in fact, is similar to some structure or some phenomena in which we uh, work. And we use uh, we, we used in uh, uh, this case the idea of not here, uh, but there is no <laughs> of uh, um, 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 uh, Inertia di sviluppo. What is no, we don't, uh, yeah, uh, developmental inertia. Developmental inertia that is a, a, a comes introduced by an Italian biologist, uh, Minelli, that thinks that in many biological uh, uh, phenomena, is, but not only the phenomena, biological phenomena, the, the way in which, for example, a town increases in its uh, uh, topomastic, no, uh, to, in its uh, uh, topology, not the topology, I don't know topography. what, topography is a, a similar uh, in this case. So you have some sort of uh, in, inertial phenomena that go towards a certain direction in a, a sp following spontaneously a certain pattern. And then for different reasons that can be natural, can be taken from the decision of human, this uh, is stopped. And so you have a sort of crisis and then there is again this sort of uh, uh, inertial development. And the same to have that the succession of inertia Stop inertia, stop inertia, stop is similar to what is predicted by the, uh, the uh, Brand principle. And so we invented a, a, a mathematical uh, concept, but I give, yeah. uh, well, I'll so, leave Daniele to speak um, about that. It's not really so much an invention, rather the fact that one of the things that we have never said in the last uh, 10 slides, but is underlying all of this, is really the idea of interpolation. Because all of these methods are a form of interpolation. You have a certain number of data. By interpolation. And then, obviously, when you have 100 points, you interpolate and you can interpolate in infinitely many ways. So then that's where the cost function comes. So you have a cost function that we kind of constrain which interpolation you consider as good. And that's where also this brand method happens because then at some point you stabilize on a model and then there is no need for further points. That's kind of the idea. And if that's the answer, it's not reachable 
then, then you need to change the algorithm. So one of the things that we believe is happening is that if in fact the phenomenon is described or describable by a unique classifier, then there is a phenomenon that we call the asymptotic analyticity. In other words, the idea being that if you have infinitely many points, then this would uniquely determine the classifier. And of course, you never have infinitely many points, but that's a concept that kind of underlines the efficiency. I, I think by, by the way, you do not know you need infinity. You have uncountable infinitely many points. Well, yeah, it, it, it depends on whether it, it depends on the control on the space. So, but then again, it depends. It's another form of forcing because it depends what kind of functions you want to you want to apply. So I think that this is probably uh, leads us to the conclusion because we had the time and I think we're good. Yeah. So the forcing idea tells us that mathematics continues to play an important role because we develop new ideas that can be used and can be tried on phenomena. So it's a kind of an odd way of thinking about mathematics because it's not directed by the solution of the problem, but rather by the, its internal development. Um, we think that hopefully by deepening our understanding of this brand principle and its homology with some of the physical phenomena, biological phenomena, economic phenomena we try to describe, we'd be able to at some point to get a better explanation of why the blind method works. And to me, this is the hope, which I've been hoping for a while, that this be, might be really a door to help us find a very new way by which mathematics can be used in disciplines where it had not been traditionally successful. Um, the success has been often forced again uh, because mathematicians have tried to use mathematics in economics or in, or in biology as if they were physics. So writing models that explain just like we use the model for gravitation and we know what the forces are and then we write the same to try to describe the stock market, but that doesn't really work. We try to do the same to describe the behavior of large masses of people, which is what economics is, and it doesn't work. So my hope is that actually this method, though in a very different way, will allow mathematics to regain an entry to, a, to fields that are of incredible importance. Uh, I think here we have some of our work. The one that, that we started talking about when I was here in, uh, in Una many years ago is the first work that we wrote with Marco and, uh, and Domenico. And then we had a few more and uh, uh, I think we, I'm, I'm really happy with the second one. The second one was really kind of a survey of uh, our ideas and hopefully find a way for mathematicians to be interested. And we actually, it was good because we had three referees, a philosopher, a mathematician, and a biologist for the second paper. So trying to see how this could be influencing things. And, uh, you know, some other people have commented on our work. And I, I want to make two yeah. very, very short comments. Uh, 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 one is uh, we think uh, that uh, this uh, phenomena has also a retroactive aspect, uh, aspect of mathematics. There's not only change uh, the way in which uh, uh, empirical science is done, but it's also trying to change uh, the way in which uh, 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 mathematics is done. Second uh, uh, remarks, uh, we speak of asymptotic, uh, uh, um, asymptotic uh, uh, analytics. analytics. Asymptotic analyticity, of course, we cannot prove that a function is uh, the, the, the limit of the asymptotic process. But so there is no, we do not say, ah, it works when the function that is detected is one, because we cannot say if the function is, because we have not an infinite point. And exactly because there is no, uh, uh, there is no understanding, we cannot prove a, 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 a limit theorem. But this is what we think that the function should be. We will not be able to prove that it is. But it seems to us that a function is working is a function that in principle should be a, a asymptotically analyzed. Thank you. Thank you. I do have a problem with the name of the science. Because science is knowledge. Accuracy is without knowledge. So knowledge without knowledge. We cannot do it on purpose. Is it we did it on purpose, yeah. <laughs>
to make clear <laughs> there is something strange here. That is exactly yeah, the reason. We took Greek in agnostic and Latin in science and we created an oxymoron. <laughs> Uh, we love the name. <laughs> we, love the name. <laughs> we are attached to the name now. For example, the example you gave uh, with this uh, arrhythmia, that perhaps uh, you are not looking for a law of nature, you are looking for something, perhaps there is not one witness, but there are many witnesses, uh, and the, what you, you do is try to, among the various data, uh, try to see which perhaps uh, by eventually false connection, mm -hmm. to have a minimal of those right. uh, Trying to see, well, I'm not sure I give you, you are suffering from that, but uh, which is normally the case for a doctor. Yeah. Uh, we need, when, when we go to a doctor, we need, at the end, he says, you are suffering from cancer, from this uh, When you say, well, you are the cancer, you are not so good. Uh, and so the, the, the question is uh, that then, if there is real, so I agree. I mean, I absolutely, we do not, the method does not look for the government. That is not mine. We, we are not looking for a law of nature, as you yeah, said. I, I, which is a new way. It's, that's actually good to read that's right. because of the supply of the physics. You know, that's right. right. And, and it is possible, in some cases, the law of nature will be understood at some point in a different way. So, so that's my, so that's my okay. second question. If, if there is a real illness or a law of nature, uh, will you, by forcing things, will you arrive at it? I give an example, a very simple example. Think of um, if you measure a certain kind of movement, uh, which are planets mm -hmm. doing it. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly the, the, the Lorenz attack. Well, well, that is, could you, I mean, could you dis discover the fact that there is in fact an equilibrium, but an equilibrium which is with drives? Uh, I think it is, it, you know, it, I don't think our method will lead to that. Yeah. I, I, I don't believe our, that, not our method, but the, 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 the general method won't really do that. But sometimes they can hint at some reality underneath. And I give an example that actually was the one from which we really started. I was working with, with Domenico actually on cancer, different things. And uh, one of the things that was interesting, there were this technique to identify, this actually came out first for, for breast cancer to identify women that would be susceptible to be treated with tamoxifen versus those who would not. So the, there is a large number of cancers that get that is successfully treated with tamoxifen. You need to know it because if you waste too much time, then the woman takes the drug that is useless, it's, it's poisonous, and then it may be too late to switch. It was done at originally using some of this blind method. Now we know how to do it because we can test for specific genes. And now, so, so there is a law of nature underneath. The, the, the blind method, though, would allow you to do a blood test to do, they use microarrays, and then to say, you're a candidate yeah. for this versus that. I think then there is a law of nature. When this method are not successful, uh, they can identify a fact that the apparently environment is not really a global environment. And this is why they, they uh, but another thing important to say, we are never said and we want to say that this method is an alternative to traditional method. Understanding is important. If we have understanding, buy right. understanding. So we are very happy. The point is not to plea for the last, for the missing of understanding, for the lack of understanding. Uh, this is very fascinating. Um, but, but I'm still 
most of the time it's actually one of because you start with that uh, these methods are not the most demonstrably appropriate to be a successful graph. I don't know if what you end up doing is actually changing the, the description of the phenomena. So if there's still something that is the most really appropriate about these methods, once you redescribe it, but once you apply the course of that method, you have demonstrated certain kind of properties, right? So then in the end, it's not true that these methods are. If we could be able to prove that a certain function is asymptotic analytical, yes, but we cannot prove it. But so the only thing that we can say is that practically the most appropriate in this present situation to say that they're demonstrably appropriate is seem to me not possible. But, but then, then what is what is demonstrably true? I mean, what is being demonstrated on the appropriateness in a certain sense of method? Well, you don't demonstrate the appropriateness. That's the thing. I mean, you you you. Uh, so take that's what I, I'd like to understand is try to figure out why is the method working. And that is not necessarily due to the fact that the method understands what the, the law of nature, the underlying law of nature is. So what we are doing is to say, is there a deep reason why the, the method explains that? If we can get to that deep reason, then I, I guess that we would get to a sort of understanding of the nature you are describing, which is different from the one possible. Take the case of page rush. Page rank and we have a demonstration. You prove that the algorithm is convergent to a certain uh, eigenvalue vector. That is proved. That the fact the eigenvalue is exactly what you have to look in order for that's another story. But you prove that the algorithm is uh, convergent to this eigenvalue. Uh, in agnostic science, you cannot do it. You have no way to prove that the succession of the algorithm is convergent. If you prove that, so you have no more agnostic science. So in some sense, making it probably appropriate means to step from a Nordic science that uh, uh, is not a, a good name to uh, non agnostic science. So Gnostic science. Gnostic science. Gnostic science. But, yeah, right. the, the, the algorithm that we have on, uh, on Arrhythmia, we are very confident that it's going to be working very well. 